Just a reminder that Big Mood, Little Mood with Daniel M. Lavery happens twice a week. Slate Plus members get an additional mini episode or Little Big Mood every Friday. Sign up now to listen at slate.com slash mood. Welcome back to the Big Mood, Little Mood show. I'm your host, Danny M. Lavery, and with me in the studio this week, I have two guests. Hallie Kiefer is the senior comedy and entertainment writer at Crooked Media. Allison Leiby is a New York-based comedian, writer, and producer who is currently on tour with her one-woman show, Oh God, a show about abortion. Together, Hallie and Allison also host Crooked Media's weekly horror film podcast, Ruined. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. What an intro. <laughs> I mean, I just, you know, I'm just thrilled. I'm so excited. I hardly know where to begin. Uh, I think we're going to have <laughs> so much. I was like, hopefully you do because we don't. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll start by talking about the problems of other people and how we can be ideally useful to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Um, and, you know, I feel like perhaps more than usual today, the questions that we are confronted with feel very like not just individual questions, but representative of very common types. Mm -hmm. Um, I I hesitate to use the word relatable because it's impossible to say it without sounding like I hate what I'm saying. But I I do think these are incredibly like common and let's go ahead and say relatable problems. And, And I think that can be genuinely useful. So I will take our first letter and then we will all maybe talk briefly about jobs we've had that bring up this particular feeling for ourselves. Because I think Anyone reads this letter and they immediately go to the last job that was this for them. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So the subject is Monday dread. Do I leave a job that is draining away my will to live? I'm a woman in my 30s in Australia receiving treatment for ADHD, depression, and anxiety. For six years, I've worked as part of a small specialized team with massive turnover, holding the fort across several generations of colleagues, often taking on special work and training staff who then leave right away. There's a new manager who is completely new to our field, so another colleague and I are still taking on 90% of the work. On the upside, I'm paid much more than I would be at other organizations, and I qualify for extended maternity leave benefits, which means that if I have a baby, I can take a year off at half pay. My husband and I have been trying for five years and are on our second round of IVF. There's a small chance I could find another job within my organization and keep my maternity leave entitlement, but it's more likely I'd have to go somewhere I no longer qualify. At most places, you need to serve a year before it kicks in. I've previously put a lot of energy into improving the work situation, but I am tapped out. I'm letting my coworkers down because I have nothing left to give. I feel defeated every day. I'm having anxiety attacks before work. My sick leave entitlement is in negative double digits. Help me to make an impossible choice. Well, this one is very hard. Yeah. I guess my first thoughts are, I know so many people who work in TV and entertainment uh, who are in this exact same situation because they're creatives or maybe have other interests, but like, need a job that has health insurance and or need stability for a variety of other reasons. I think to me, my gut instinct reading this is, because I was like, oh boy, that's hard. And then you get to the last couple sentences. And when you say, I feel defeated every day, I'm having anxiety attacks from work, my sick leave entitlement, like it is to me, that's the signal. And I think a lot of times we are forced to ignore the physical um, experience of our body in order to like, whether it's to do work or I hate to bring this up because I bring it up every time I talk about anything, but I came out last year and I've been sort of processing like, well, why wouldn't I know that? Like, what were my expectations about my own happiness? You know, like both physically and like mentally. So reading this, it's like your body is telling you this and it's just very hard because I completely understand that. Like to look for a new job. I mean, I can, I, I know what it's like here. I don't know what it's like in Australia. I imagine it's kind of similar. It's so stressful. But I think that knowing that you're physically having these symptoms, that is your key of what you, uh, clue to what you have to do, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And especially like the, obviously I understand wanting to, you know, if you're, if you're trying to start a family, wanting to protect your ability to actually take leave and, and begin that phase of your life. But right now it's a hypothetical and 
I don't know, like staying somewhere that is making you like physically um, unwell is not like isn't worth like. Well, if I do get pregnant, I would get the mat leave where it's like, well, right now that's not actually like I I would take care of like what's happening with you in your life right now and not in this like possible future that like may or may not be different in a lot of different ways. You know, you never know. Like maybe there is a place that, you know, if you started working and you were there for a couple of months and you got pregnant, that there would be some kind of like manageable. I mean, I got to imagine every country is better than ours when it comes to I know. just loose like, protections so. for new yeah. parents. Um <laughs> I don't know. I say, I, you know, I'm always very pro quit your job if you can. Yeah. And I share that sense of, I, I was worried about finding a way to describe this issue that didn't feel dismissive of the letter writer's desire to get pregnant. And the fact that my guess is, gosh, five years of trying, that's got to be really draining um, and, and challenging. But I, I agree the problem that you have right now is this is draining your will to live. You have daily anxiety attacks. You've maxed out your sick leave entitlement. You you aren't yet pregnant. And so that's not to say it won't happen or that you should act as if it won't happen. Just that if you continue to prioritize this pretty good maternity leave policy over everything else, you're going to have two dogs. Uh, you're going to run things into the ground. Yes. And and so, yeah, I think, again, not like, don't worry about that. You probably won't get pregnant. That's not what I'm trying to say so much as just worry about that problem when that's your problem. The problem you have right now is A of all much bigger and B of all here right now. I remember like my dad always said, like, I remember when I would be like searching for jobs or in job transitions, I would always be like, well, what if, what if both of these things do or don't happen? Like, what if I have an offer from here? And I think, but like, and my dad was always like, okay, well, what is real today? And I'm like, oh, nothing. None of those things are real. And he's like, so maybe just take care of what you can take care of today. Like, folk, like those aren't problems until they're actually problems. And for now, you do have like a real reality in front of you that you need to address. Again, not to dismiss, you know, the long journey towards getting pregnant and starting a family and what you need to do to protect yourself and your family in that moment. But right now, you just have to take care of you, which feels like not giving your whole life to this job that is only draining you. Yes. So I think we're all on the same page in terms of you need to prioritize your current crisis mm -hmm. above a good maternity leave policy, especially because the letter writer says, you know, a lot of places don't have the same policy, but it's not a guarantee. You can't rule out the possibility that another place will have an equally good policy. What's so funny is I, I feel like I actually know a friend who worked, this was at Viacom, and similarly was sort of stuck in a job because of the idea of like, well, when we try to get pregnant... Of course, by the time they did get pregnant, she had left that job. They had moved to a different country because of her husband's job. So it's like, again, now that that's going to happen specifically to you, but it was... Never, is, no. She was in the exact same situation you were in, and the situation changed in a way that she couldn't expect. So, it, and it was not a worse situation. It was just different. So I think it sounds like this person's probably like mentally like, I could, which I completely, I sort of like crouched and like, here are my options. Versus there are these options. We just don't know what they are until you pass through, you know, sort of the doorway to looking for a job or, or that kind of thing. And not for nothing, I have friends who've done IVF and that's incredibly stressful, both mentally and physically. You, you got to give yourself a break. You, yeah. you got to give yourself a moment to breathe and relax and try to enjoy some part rather than if I, if I just hunker down, I could power through it. Your body's telling you, we, we're not doing it. We can't do that. Yeah. So in, in light of that, then I have a question for the two of you because I, I, I was of two minds about this. One was, I think quitting her job would be a great idea. I would support that. I think that would be good. Even without a safety net, it sounds, or not a, sorry, not without a safety net, without like a, another job lined up right away. It sounds like she's been making enough money. And usually in situations like this, the letter writer will say, I couldn't afford to quit this job. It sounds like there's a little bit of a safety net or a buffer. So uh, if that's the case, I would definitely say, even though obviously it would not be financially beneficial to quit without a job lined up, if it's not going to be immediately ruinous, it's definitely worth considering. My other thought was, and the letter writer will know better than we do how possible this is, is it possible to make this job more bearable, not because you're going to stay here for the next 10 years, but so that you are not driving yourself in quite the same way until you find a better job. So one thing that I just noticed was 
You say there's a new manager who's completely new to our field. So another colleague and I are still taking on 90 percent of the work. And again, if that's coming from the top down and you have been told if you don't keep doing your share of the 90 percent of this work, you will be fired. That's one thing. But if that's not what's happening, I would strongly encourage you to say in writing as well as in person. Yeah. Yeah. I can't keep doing this additional work. That's not going to work. And and here you can kind of lean into the fact that small team, high turnover, they probably need you more than you need them at this point. And so maybe in another job, if you were blowing through your sick days and announcing you're no longer going to do part of this work, you might worry about getting fired. But it kind of sounds like here they really, really need people to stay. And I think one one thing I would suggest floating, you know, with your partner, with your care team, and then planning to enact at work is saying like, from now on, all this stuff gets forwarded to the new manager because there's a person there doing the job. Even if they are not perfectly trained, even if they don't know everything, even if they might have to get some questions answered from other higher ups, I think it would really be maybe a good thing to say, all right, I'm going to try quitting in six months. And in the meantime, you know, Monday morning, I go in and say, I'm no longer doing any of this new work. I can't keep doing it. I'm at absolute crisis capacity mode. And again, that's not saying you have to blame other people or say you've been doing a bad job. You just let it be known. I can't keep doing two jobs. And then genuinely let the chips fall where they may. And if it feels like I'd be so anxious, I'd feel so guilty, that's a problem to work, I think, with your care team about how do you handle guilt um, when this is, in fact, a totally appropriate thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Hard boundaries are something that I didn't learn until the beginning of COVID. Um, I was always just like, you can email me at any time. I will do any amount of work. I will do a show in the middle of New Jersey at Wednesday at 1 a.m. If that means I'll get $10 and I'll walk there if I have to. Like truly just never had. And I in kind of in the lockdown and kind of reevaluating and kind of watching different parts of my life change in the last three or four years. Like really, I mean, and Hallie can like attest to this because I certainly have them. Like I have set up like really hard, intense boundaries and like, no is a complete sentence. And like, you can just say like, I can't do this anymore. So like somebody else needs to pick up this thing or I'm not doing these evening meetings or like whatever it is that's kind of like making this job even more of a slog. And like, you can just say like, I no longer, it's not. And if they're like, no, you have to do it, then why not ask for more money as long as you're there? Right. And I think at that stage, yeah, if their response is really bad, I would then encourage the letter writer to say, all right, you know what? Today is my notice. Exactly. Like if you're already considering it, you might as well. It's like the leverage you have is I will walk away because you already want to walk away. Clearly, it's just that there's other complicating factors. And I think it will be very revealing to this letter writer if they do come back and say, fuck you. Like, absolutely not. You, This is your work. Because then then I think then you'll know. Like then it's like, well, then that's then there is no way for me to do this in a way that is mentally or physically healthy for myself. Yeah. And I think too, you know, it's not super clear to me. My guess is that thing about I'm letting my coworkers down is a lot of that's coming internally. Again, it's just possible there was information the letter writer left out, but it doesn't sound like I'm getting emails angry from my colleagues who really expect me to keep up this blistering pace. My guess is it's more of a sense of we're all in this really difficult situation and I feel bad every time I'm not able to do two jobs cheerfully. (laughs) And so I really worry. And I think, again, it would be a lot easier for you if you just communicated to your coworkers. I get that we're all going to have a tough time if this deadline doesn't get met, but the solution can no longer be I do two jobs because that's not working. And I really hope and believe that your coworkers will probably understand and sympathize and will not say, this is your fault. The only way this organization can stay afloat is if you keep working yourself into the ground. And so my If the fear there is just, I couldn't possibly say that to them because I would feel so guilty. Again, take that to your care team, take that to your treatment team and figure out what do I need in order to send that email, in order to set that meeting up, in order to say, from now on, I no longer answer these emails from clients. I no longer build this product. Whatever the work is that this new manager needs to be doing to just say, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I think start with that. If that sounds impossible, work with your treatment team. Um, if the company's response to that is, no, you got to keep doing it, I think put in your notice. And also like companies care about themselves first. They aren't your friends or your family. So like, yeah. you know, yes, you have this like good opportunity for maternity leave down the road, but like 
that could go, they could lose money and be like, we got to start cutting some benefit. Like you just never know. Like they could turn around, they will fire you in a second. So you should be able to have the same freedom to quit whenever on your terms too. I think so too. And I would love to hear an update letter writer in your own time. I don't want to give you another assignment. You're busy. (laughs) But, you know, if at some point, eight months, a year from now, things have slightly settled down and you would like to let us know how you're doing, we'd love to hear from you. But truly, put that low on your list of priorities. And I think with that, we might be ready for our second letter. All right. Confused client. Uh, I have been seeing my therapist for eight years. She has been important in getting me through tough times with bipolar disorder, and I value her advice. However, she's recently said things that have made me feel like I'm losing respect for her judgment. I told her my partner of six years and I, we're a straight couple in our 30s, are considering becoming parents, and she was horrified. We both have mental illness, and she told me in detail about her personal struggle being overwhelmed after the birth of her child and worried our child would end up with child services. I was shaken by her visceral reaction and changed the subject. My partner and I are stable in our mental health now, and my psychiatrist supports me in this. We are not considering having children lightly. Then, in our last meeting, I mentioned I wanted to go hunting with my family. My therapist said she recently bought a gun in case the government comes for her house and that she would, and that she would die protecting it. I was shocked, both because this is an uncommon sentiment in Canada, and she had never stated her personal beliefs before. Using guns for anything besides hunting is completely against my values. I said that I support her responsible gun ownership, then change topics. She has supported me in rough times, and I worry that I will need her help in the future, but I don't think she is right. What to say? Ooh, girl. Yeah, I mean, I think we all know the answer to this. Uh, It feels like it's time for a new mental health professional uh, in your life. I think also, like, we do. I I remember my own therapy journeys, like, not really thinking about this, but it's like, you know, you outgrow romantic partners, you outgrow friendships, you outgrow professional relationships. Like, you can also outgrow your mental health professional relationship. Like, that is somebody that, like, even if she was so helpful and so valuable, during really tough times in your mental health journeys, it doesn't mean that she always will be. And there is absolutely always room for you to reevaluate that relationship. It also feels like, and I say this as like, just like uh, what struck me is like, and I'm not saying this, a letter writer has to take this on and I please do not take this on. It does sound like maybe your therapist, because you've been going to her for so long, is herself having a mental health crisis or is herself going through something. If it is, You've been going to her for nearly a decade and then recently her behavior has changed. I think you probably know enough about your own mental health to say, you know, this feels very out of left field for this person. And I think the fact that you're flagging this is the information you need. Again, like you've been going to her for years. This is not like a new person where you have to figure out, is this what she's always like? Am I just misunderstanding? Again, the, both these things are a professional over. I'm not a, obviously a therapist, but these feel like like if a regular doctor told me either of these things, like a, like a general practitioner, I'd be like, this is inappropriate, let alone a therapist. So I think you're, you are right to flag it. And I think the time is to start looking for someone else. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think kind of like the, with our first letter, I want to be able to offer this letter writer multiple options. And I think it would absolutely be fine. I think it is fine to look for a new therapist for many, many reasons. And that certainly if the letter writer wants to do so now, they should feel really free to. Um, The other thing that I just noticed was there's two moments the letter writer says, I was really shaken. I was really troubled. I changed the subject. And again, that's not to say you have to stay with one therapist for your whole life, no matter what they say and duke it out. But I also wonder, this is a relationship that's gone on for eight years. These are the first two times it sounds like maybe there's been a strong moment of surprise and disagreement. And again, you can always decide to have this conversation. And then if you don't like how it goes, say, this is the end of the road for us. So I don't even mean to present this as an either or, but I think it would do you good to have a conversation with your therapist, not where you go in with the goal of, I want her to renounce those things that she said or apologize, but just where we have one conversation where we disagree with each other. I think it's important, again, if you 
tell her how those things made you feel. And her only response is, no, I think you're too crazy to reproduce and you're a danger to yourself and I can't wait to shoot a Mountie. Absolutely feel free to, you know, walk out, say, thank you for letting me know, best (laughs) of luck and just move on. I, I don't mean to say like, no, you have to go meet in like the exchange of ideas marketplace um, and stick it out for hours and hours. But again, like longstanding relationship, you were really surprised. It sounds like there was something you wanted to say, but didn't. And so I would just encourage you to consider, could you imagine yourself saying in an email, uh, could you imagine yourself at your next appointment saying, I want to bring up these two things you said to me recently. They troubled me. I'm a little nervous about bringing them up now. And I'd like you just to listen and hear me out and for us to talk about. I just, again, not that I want to encourage like nonstop adversarial relationships with a therapist, but I think it's good to make some room for the possibility of, I'm sorry to say it, but like dialogue and repair. And again, if her reaction is terrible again, then I think it's totally understandable to walk away. You don't have to do this. I won't think that you're like an avoidant bad person if you don't. I just wanted to put it as an option because it sounds like you really felt in that moment, like I want to say something, but I don't know how. And sometimes it can help to go back and just try one more time. I've certainly benefited in times from my own relationships, kind of being on the edge of, I felt uncomfortable. I didn't say anything in the moment. And now I feel like maybe it's too late to bring something up later. And I just think, that would be okay um, to say like, it really troubled me both that you shared these personal details, like as a boundary, I don't want you to share these personal details with me. But then also I'm troubled that you you made such like a strong value statement about me not being fit to parent. What do you think about those things? Do you on reflection think they were like sensible, good things to say? Do you feel differently? Do you want to update it? Do you have different thoughts? Like, did you mean something? Like, again, truly just being open to like, what do you have to say about that thought? And then you can use your best judgment. You know, if she gives you an answer that you feel like, I think I could work with that. I feel like you've understood yourself better, or you've clarified something, or you've changed your mind, or you made a meaningful apology, or you've just told me something that makes me really change how I see you. Um, Does that feel possible? Does the idea of doing that with a therapist sound just like that's too intense? You should just look for someone who won't say those things. Yeah. I, I feel like to me, it's like once you bring up the, the meeting a gun for the government to take your house, I'm like, I'm, and maybe that's just the American in me, you know, but to me, I'm like, that is not something I want a therapist to bring up. Like it just, it to me, that is, because yeah. I don't know that I do agree the, the parenting thing. I don't know there, maybe that was like some emotional thing that was like her in the therapist's own experience that was bringing up. That makes sense to then go to the gun thing. I just feel, I, I'm just going to say if this if letter writer, if you want to leave and you're asking for us to tell you to not go to this person, let me be the one to say, you don't have to if you don't want to, if you already feel like this was too much. Yes. I think that's a really good place to land. And that even if you just maybe then wanted to like send an email that was like, I don't want to schedule another session and here's why. And I hope you will reconsider saying these to other patients in the future. Again, you don't have to. You're not doing a bad job if you don't. I think that the reason I wanted to encourage that was because of that like longstanding eight-year relationship. But I think you're right. Those are two pretty extreme statements. And I think the really important thing for the letter writer to bear in mind, again, I don't want to put the cart before the horse. This letter writer is not currently expecting a child. But I feel like if your therapist says to you, I worry a future child of yours might end up in child services, given that many therapists are themselves mandatory reporters, I feel like part of what she is saying is things that you might say to me in our therapeutic sessions, I might be kind of flagging in advance because I want to report you. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think for your own, again, not that I'm trying to encourage, like, I would want you to be endangering your child and going to a therapist and for the therapist not to take that seriously. I just think in this context, which is not, I have harmed or neglected a child. And then my therapist says, I have to report that. Just generally, my therapist says, I think you're so mentally ill that I want to invoke the possibility of your child being taken from you. That to me seems like she's flagging. I might report you. And so that would also be something to seriously consider. I feel like it could also be, you know, if you are going to, if you are talking about family planning, you're thinking about starting a family with your partner, like maybe it's a perfect opportunity to start seeing someone new in this new phase of your life as your mental health professional, because 
I don't know if this one is it. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think this is helpful. I, I have now come around to, I don't think it's a good idea to have that conversation in a session in the hopes of like repair. I think it would be fine to just move on. It would also be okay to say, here's why I'm not going to come back. I hope you don't say these things again. What I would encourage you is when you meet with potential new therapists, tell them why you've left your old therapist so that you can talk about it with somebody else. I want you to get therapeutic help with these two really distressing incidents. And I want it to be from a therapist with good boundaries. That's a great first session. (laughs) Right? It's just like, help me figure this one out, please. How do I weigh that against eight otherwise seemingly helpful years? Does it now make me reconsider some of her other advice? How do I think about her? I think that would all be really appropriate. I also, at this point too, would welcome if there are any licensed therapists listening to the show who feel like, wow, one or both of the things the therapist said are like way more concerning and and you should be thinking about additional interventions, you know, please feel free to write in and let us know. I have my own kind of like, whoa, those are big uh, <laughs> yeah, red absolutely. flags. But Agreed. Trying to think of, yeah, I've never had a therapist say anything quite like that to me and I I really would not know how to respond. No, I don't know any of my therapists' um, stances on h- how they would use guns to protect their house from the government, but I imagine that none of them uh, would, <laughs> from what I know of them. <laughs> yeah, I just, in this day and age, uh-uh, to be yeah. bringing up the guns and the government. And, and in therapy, Canada. I just, in, well, I'll tell you what, bad year, even more red flag maybe in Canada. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, you know. Much to ponder, I guess, as they say. And I'm just really sorry, letter writer. Like, that just sounds like really distressing. That is not garden variety. Like, oh, my therapist said something that implied she didn't really think my boyfriend was great. Or like my therapist kind of critiqued me in a way that reminded me of my mom that would maybe be like, well, it's hard to talk to people. Or like therapy can involve like difficult emotions. This is Mm -hmm. just... Yeah. And it's hard enough when anyone in your life kind of starts saying things out of pocket like that. And like for it to be someone whose job is guiding your mental health and keeping you healthy. Like it's just, it's a, you know, when it's a friend, it's already wild when someone drops a, a new political stance or, you know, says something very judgmental about something you're doing in your life. But again, for it to be this person who you've trusted for so long and has been on your journey with you, that's just a tough, situation to be in. I I feel very bad that you have to go through that. I also just like, I really like my apartment and I hope no one ever takes it away from me. But man, if the government showed up and said, we are taking your apartment, I would not die for it. I would walk out of here with as much stuff as I could carry. for a landlord. That's for sure. Buy some luggage. I'll be right back. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I would be annoyed. Uh, I'd be, I'd be miffed. Um, Deeply miffed. I would would walk off miffed uh, and and alive. (laughs) That's, that's how I would handle that situation. Well, I feel like this is a great moment to sort of like pause and and collect ourselves. I realized too, I forgot to ask, did you ever have a job like the first letter that made you feel like I'm going to freak out every time I wake up? Um, You know, I feel like I definitely did. But as I said, I came out last year and I look back on how much of my anxiety and depression during like my 20s was being closeted to myself. And I wonder, there is some sort of the same feeling of stasis that like, it it just feel like if you can't imagine something different or like, you're like, these are my only options. It's so hard to like psychologically imagine something different. So I definitely have, but I don't know. I wonder like if, if I, if I, not like if I had to come out, I would have liked my job, but rather like I would have been able to have a separation from it that I didn't at the time because I didn't, I wasn't connected to myself. So yeah, I've definitely been this where you're like, I guess I'm just gonna have a panic attack at work and then I'll just be, I'll just sit back down. And and then that's just what my job is. And it's horrible. So I really am so sympathetic. Yeah. I certainly have had a lot of jobs, like in my early to mid twenties, I had a lot of like day jobs, like real, jo- like, but it was just not what I wanted to do. And there was kind of like a couple of years where I was working kind of adjacent to the entertainment industry. I was working in book publishing and museums. And I was like, this is supposed... I think the hardest part was I was like, this is supposed to be satisfying because it's quote unquote a creative job in a, at a major New York museum or for a huge publishing house. Like this was what... When I graduated from college, like this was the plan. And I was so unhappy at both of those because it 
it just wasn't what I wanted to do that like I would have, even though they were like perfectly good jobs that if I, it's just, I was like, this just isn't the fit for me. And I feel like that extra kind of like, but it's on paper good. Like, why is it, why am I miserable if this is, I mean, obviously like they both paid me under $40,000 a year, but like there, there was kind of that like disparity where you're like, this is supposed to feel good, but it really feels bad. And then I would just like freak out every day. I'm like, if this isn't it, what is it? And it's like, and then I figured it out and it was doing comedy. Oh my God, that little doggy. Um, oh, what the a best face. part about this and which no listener will be able to hear is I have my blurred background on. So he's been periodically like appearing on my camera as this little blur. <laughs> and then I know he's about to walk all over my microphone and equipment. Oh, love and, a little pet. Uh, he has no regard, no regard for my attempts to, to work. Yeah, I, I remember my last uh, day job in academic publishing that was just like, I, I, again, like there are worse problems in the world than having a job, but man, I really hated this job. And uh, it really it really got to a point for me where it just felt like I don't have a lot of options and I cannot, like working a job that is genuinely like draining and destructive and like overbearing is really hard. It's really stressful. Um, and especially one where you are regularly being asked to do the jobs of multiple people. And then everyone just acts like that's sustainable. So um, much of our waking life that like, if there's something even a little not great with a job, that's everything. That's that's 50 hours a week probably being conservative at this point with the way that capitalism has made us all cogs in the wheel of of making money for rich people. But like, it is so much of your time. <laughs> like there's just so many hours that get devoted to the concept of work that when it's not good, man, nothing's good. Yeah. And before that job, I had waited tables for a few years. And I actually, in a lot of ways, really preferred that kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I could easily get incredibly stressed out by being slightly in the weeds. And I once had a colleague who really helped me out because I was just freaking out one afternoon. And she was just like, it is lunch. <laughs> no one is going to die. Uh, yeah, That's all so of good. the problems That's in front really of you funny. are non-emergencies, and it just really helped me be like, because I was just like, and their salad is not ready on time, and I messed up that sandwich, and it was just like, yeah, you want to fix those things, you want to get tips, like you want to be efficient, but also, none of this is brain surgery. The worst thing that will happen to anyone today is they will get their lunch later than they thought. That's yes. it. and by like minutes, not like tomorrow. <laughs> right. It's not going to be like, and then they sat there all day. Right. Exactly. It's like, you know, nobody's sitting down for a salad and it's like, it's five minutes late. And I was like, well, I was supposed to be in surgery and now that guy's dead. Like even that degree of severity right. doesn't Those exist. Those surgeons <laughs> planned their lunches differently than that. Yeah. Um, well, I would love to, if you have the time and the inclination, talk a little bit about presumably a job you have that you both like, which is your horror podcast that you do together. I would love to hear a little bit more about that. It's called Ruined. What's Ruined? What are the ruins? Yeah. So Ruined uh, is a horror movie recap podcast. Um, I, I'm Hallie. This is my, I, don't, I feel so like, if there's no video, can you tell which one is talking? But I'm Hallie. And I love horror movies. And Allison doesn't hate them, but is so psychologically disturbed by them. You have terrible dreams is how I think about it. Yeah. I get really bad nightmares. Honestly, I watched an episode of The Idol and had nightmares Ooh. about that. <laughs> which I've will, seen uh, clips which, that I have nightmares. Maybe justifiable to have nightmares about the idol. Um, but for horror movies, I'm just like, oh boy, I just get bad nightmares and I can't get them out of my head. But I just want to know, horror is such a genre that becomes part of the cultural conversation in a way that like other films don't always make it in into like every, like I don't watch horror movies like before the podcast even. And I would still know like, Hereditary's the movie. Like, what is that about? And I just, I was dying to know. And Hallie always wanted to spoil, to ruin movies for me. And I was like, you can tell me. I'm never going to see it. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it sort of was more from that. And um, yeah, basically every week we just, I sort of just relayed the contents of a movie. I have Allison try to guess what happens. Uh, and it, she's gotten incredibly good at it because it is a beautiful formula for every movie. <laughs> and it's also just an excuse to scream about things. We, we joined Crooked Media in April and I feel like we've been screaming about more politically about things. And that makes sense because horror is you know, about the body. And unfortunately, in these trying times, well, I guess they're all of human history, like the body is uh, constantly uh, being subjected to horrors in America. So that's, it's kind of a nice to like, segue a little bit more in that direction. 
But God, I I was gonna watch the horror movies anyway. So if if you're whether you love horror movies and kind of like to listen to like a recap, which I also do, and I also read like uh, recaps of things. Or you're someone who can't watch it. I feel like it's it's kind of a, a a mix of both who listen. Yeah, some and we do everything from like you know big blockbustery like new movies that are really buzzy to like you know little B movies from the '80s that maybe you've never heard of but are hilariously wild in their plot. So there's just like something for everybody. And if you love horror, Hallie is an absolute student of the genre and is so good at explaining these movies. I feel like I've seen a lot of them and I never have. That's very nice album. Um, yeah, I uh, we just did Bo is Afraid, which is Ari Aster's new movie, which is not horror per se, though it has horror elements. And again, like, I don't... I, it's just a genre that never gets old. I don't know. Like, it's just like a constantly renewing well um, of, of it's really disturbing imagery, which I really enjoy. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about Stephen King this week because I was... I recently rewatching Misery and having the same reaction to Kathy Bates and Misery that I do to whenever I read about Henry VIII, which is, mm. you fools, I could have made her happy. <laughs> um, which is both like a really weird relationship to have to a certain type of like tyranny. Um, but I, I was thinking a lot about how like, at least in my admittedly like, limited understanding of King, it feels like the novel's more than otherwise tend to end with like a survivor or on an up note, like Pet Cemetery and a few others being notable exceptions. And the short stories tending to have the more like uh, downer endings or like evil takes over. Um, and thinking about it just also in terms of like whether or not I think of horror as like breaking down into either comic or tragic endings. Like either somebody makes it and like the world can be restored or everyone dies and whether mm -hmm. or not more than other genres, I think of it as like slotting into those two categories. And I'm not sure if that's accurate or if there's any idea behind that other than a sort of general impression, but I'm curious if you've felt like, does it feel like more of the horror movies that you two talk about on the show tend to have like a clearly downbeat or a clearly recuperative ending or does that you know, not quite feel like question. it fits? I, I feel like more and more, and this is just my own um, personal uh, relationship with the genre, I think. I think after coming out, too, I, I definitely find myself more in the vein of wanting more of a downbeat ending and wanting more blood and, like, more viscera versus, like, I feel like I was a very horror comedy person. And I still love horror comedy, but, like, more of, like, a silly or, like, a goofy or campy. And now I really want, like, the hereditaries of the world. I really want something horrifying and I think it's like, you know, it's the idea of uh, watching something horrible happen that is fiction as like a form of catharsis or like a form of like anxiety release. I, it makes a lot of sense to me. I don't know. But but in terms of like w enjoyability, like I certainly personally love both. But um, I see the val a value in a, a really downbeat ending, I guess. I, maybe just because I'm in a mood today to watch Hereditary again that I'm like, I just want to see some horrible happen. Oh, you're the only person I know who's like, I could really go for a rewatch of Hereditary. <laughs> Sometimes I'll just watch Teddy, uh, Tony Collette, but not the dinner scene, the one where she's at group therapy. I'll just put that on YouTube and watch that scene. It really puts a smile <laughs> on my face. I know. I don't know. What is that? So, yeah. I think if you're, a if you're a therapist who was already replying, <laughs> just reply about that too. Yeah. Well, if you two have a minute... We have a sort of lightning round question that I think Ooh, we can okay. answer rather quickly if you're up for it. So the subject is not enough friendship points to unlock my tragic backstory. Ooh. Okay. I've spent most of my life with multiple pretty severe mental illnesses and most of my 20s as the caretaker for both of my now dead parents. This has made it really difficult for me to find and hold down a job, which sucks, but I'm working with professionals on that and it's not the thing that I'm asking about. What I am asking about is what to say when I meet new people and they ask me what I do for a living. I know this is supposed to be light small talk, but I don't want to get into my tragic backstory with someone I barely know, and I don't think they want to hear either. At the moment, I can either get vague and change the topic, uh, talk about things I like to do like my hobbies, which really doesn't answer the question, or out and out lie, but that feels bad. Is there any way I can answer this that doesn't make me reveal really dark and personal things? I just want to have something resembling a social life that's not about my problems, but also where I'm not lying to people I hope will be my friend. I mean, I think that this person, one, you don't owe, nobody deserves information about your life that you don't want to give them. So you don't have to open up. Um, and that includes like what your current professional setup is. Like there are lots of even, you know, less 
difficult and dramatic scenario. It's that people don't want to talk about, I don't like telling people I'm a comedian because it's a really annoying conversation on an airplane. So I say, you know, a number of other vague things that just gets us off the topic. I think that like anybody who drills down beyond like an answer that you feel comfortable with, like something vague or something kind of deflecting to another topic, like talking about things that you do like, or maybe talk about you would love to work somewhere like blah, blah, blah one day, like, because you're really interested in painting. Oh, I majored in art, whatever. Like any conversation that gets you off of a path towards a harder conversation that you're not interested in is is fine. And people that push and are like, well, what do you do? Where do you make your money? What do you, it's like, those people are assholes and they don't deserve time talking to you. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I was like, if somebody asked you, just be like, hey, man, I'm just here to party. Like, just like literally <laughs> just refuse to answer. Like, hey, whatever. Like, just like, because then if somebody said to me, you'd be like, that's fair enough. I will say when I lived in New York for years, I do remember asking people, what do you do? And then in LA, I have switched to, so what have you been getting up to? And that's because so many people aren't working or like aren't have working. different weird schedules. And right now, because the strike, but also like, actors and creative people it's like yeah some people aren't working and then it's like well I'm working but that's not my focus like so many people have day jobs so I do agree that that is not always a helpful um question so I don't know I say just 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 don't answer like just be like well, hey man whatever I don't even know like do do whatever you want I understand because also I'm like hey you could lie but I understand if you wanted to like pursue a friendship with this person later I don't know it's like sorry about that thing but I don't know if somebody lied to my face about their job and then later we're like, hey, uh, now that I know you better, like, I just want you to know I had this traumatic stuff happen. I'd be like, that's fine. But also, I'm that kind of person. So, you know, take that as you will, you know? Yeah. I, I think I would just go with the truth, which is I used to be a caretaker and now I'm taking some time off, which again, you never have to then go back and say that actually wasn't true. You just could later add more detail, but it's also not going to like invite further questions. It's not weirdly vague in a way that people are going to kind of raise an eyebrow at. They're going to be like, oh, that must have been a lot of work. And you could be like, yeah, it's a lot of work. So I'm going to change fields, but I'm figuring things out right now. You know, again, just like you, you could even stretch it as far as I used to be in home health care. Again, true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then now I'm changing careers and I'm trying to figure it out, taking time off. People understand that, especially about a, a field like home health care. So I think that that's going to gesture towards the truth enough that you won't feel like a liar, but will get you out of unnecessary conversations. And I get it because I've needed to work on my, why did you move to New York conversation? Because the short answer is I found out most of my family was pedophiles and like in a frenzy, my wife and I decided to upend our life and move across the country. There's no way to bring that up in small talk that does not bring things to a dead halt. But if people ask and I'm just like, oh, we just wanted to change, I feel insane. And so I've had to try to figure out like, what's something that gestures towards like, changed my life, but is not, we just met and now I'm talking to you about pedophiles because nobody wants that. Not even me. Yeah, absolutely. And on that note, <laughs> we've solved everybody's <laughs> what problems. An end note. Yeah. Uh, thank you too so much. I, I genuinely feel uh, bolstered by this and, and hopeful that our, our listeners will, will be able to make some good decisions as a result of our conversation today, which is always a great feeling. Thank you so much for having us. This was really fun. Yeah, I had a blast. I love other people's problems. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Yeah, well, Give to me. let me know if you ever decide to cover misery on the show, and I can we tell you exactly. We have done misery, but but we'll keep you in mind. But just in case you ever need to talk about how to make her happy, which James Con barely tried to do. I don't think we've done misery. We did do misery. Okay, it must have been when I was doing my show. Um, at any rate, it's really easy. All she wanted to do was bring you snacks in bed and tell you you're amazing. And in return, all she wanted was for you to constantly lie to keep her terrifying temper in check. <laughs> Is that so hard? And there's plenty of those relationships now. So, I mean, I, you definitely could get it done. Amazing. Thank you both so, so much for making time for us. And uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining us on Big Mood, Little Mood with me, Danny Lavery. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. Don't miss an episode of the show. Head to slate.com slash mood to sign up to subscribe or hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using right now. Thanks. Also, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to know what you think. If you want more Big Mood, Little Mood, you should join Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. Members get an extra episode of Big Mood, Little Mood every Friday, and you'll get to hear more advice or conversations with our guest. And as a Slate Plus member, you'll also be supporting the show. 
Go to slate.com forward slash mood plus to sign up. It's just $15 for your first three months. If you'd like me to read your letter on the show, maybe you need a little advice, maybe you need some big advice, head to slate.com slash mood to find our big mood, little mood listener question form or find a link in the description on the platform you're using right now. Thanks for listening. And here's a preview of our Slate Plus episode coming this Friday. I hate to sound like Calvin's dad from Calvin and Hobbes, but like, who told you life was going to be fair? In most generations, we'd all be like dead from not eating enough like vitamin C. We'd be like lost at sea. We'd have run out of teeth by our 30s. It's completely unfair that we get to live in a world with like corrective eyewear and nylon and microwave technology when like most people died at 20. Like, that's not fair either. And I really mean that, like... Yeah. And I've also just, in a romantic or personal relationship, I've never heard someone so successfully argue that they were in an unfair position that I felt like, I see things from your point of view, I now want you to have this thing. It just always feels like, what what is this, like, scorekeeping you're doing? To listen to the rest of that conversation, join Slate Plus now at slate.com forward slash mood.